All right, guys, here we are. Welcome, everyone. This is Life in the Peloton, brought to you by our major partner this year, Map. Exciting working with these guys, making all these great podcasts we got here at Life in the Peloton. But this is something different. We started at the end of last year. This is the Race Communique. And of course, if you heard it already last year, I'm joined by my two guests, my two mates, Luke Durbridge and Tom Southern. Guys, welcome back. Welcome to the new year. Happy New Year. Thanks for having us back. Yeah, nice to be here, mate. Let's talk about this series because well, we've actually got some really exciting news because the Race Communique this year is going to be exclusively brought to you by the Escape Collective. Mitch, I want to ask you about these guys because these are the guys that didn't show up to the Tour de France cricket last year, right? <laughs> That's right. Like These these are the guys who Sounds used to- Sounds Are you sure they're a good sponsor? <laughs> These guys used to run Cycling Tips, a website I used to love, and then they've gone out, a great website. They've gone out, now they're 100% supported by their members who believe that cycling meters should be brought to you independently. It's really cool because it's actually what we're trying to do here at Life of the Peloton. We've started up our own little club, the Pelo, get across and sign up, and that's what they're doing over the Escape Collective. I've been checking it out in preparation for this episode. You're saying I should change my morning coffee open the laptop from Cycling News to Race Communicate. That's what you're saying. And with all the, the good journalism beyond that, it's the one place to go. Well, the Race Communicate, of course. You can you can hear all the all the knowledge of the Race Communicate. I would suggest you go across the Escape Collective, bud. It's really going to be fun working with these guys this year because we've got some really fun stuff coming up. We've got the Life in the Peloton League for their fantasy competition. This is going to be our chance to try and stitch either, each other up. I played it last year with one of the owners of the Escape collective wade wallace he roped me into it and it was actually quite fun we did the welter it's essentially like you've got to pick well it's not essentially it is you've got to pick the race winner of each day and it becomes really yeah really fun so we're going to start a life in the peloton version we're going to start the race communique version and the listeners are going to be able to get involved and it's going to be a competition obviously between the three of us but also the rest of the world out there can jump on board and see who knows the peloton well sell them I'm just going to say it's not going to be fair on you guys. I mean, I'm a full-time DS. I'm going to easily win that, guys. Hands down, though. I play this with my uh, sister and her husband, and we play at every mm-hmm. Grand Tour, and I'm a lot of the time in the Grand Tour, and I don't, mm-hmm. I don't win very often because, you know, when you're, in the, when you're in the last group in the road all the time, you have no idea who, who won the race anyway. So you don't, you don't bet during the race. You bet. You, you make your pick. After the race, why do you need to know, like, you don't need to be there watching who's winning and then you're making your calculation five seconds before the finish. Oh, it looks like, you know, Del Toro's going to win. Quick, put my click in. I'm on his wheel. All right, well, let's just talk about what is going on in the show because if you haven't heard this show before or you knew or you just forgot what we're doing last year, we've sort of broken into three segments, three areas of our expertise. You know, Dervo being a pro, he's a guy who's raced in the Peloton for about 12 years or something like that. He should know what's going on. We've created Pelo Chat. With Luke Derbridge, what's going on inside the Pro Pelo? Derbo, what have you got for us this week? What are you going to wrap up? Well, this week we've got we've been outside the Peloton for quite a while because it's been the off-season, pre-season. So we're going to cover a bit of pre-season. Um, we're going to go into what we do in the pre-season, things like that. We're going to talk about pros doing bunchies. Uh, that's a big thing in Aussie summer. We like to discuss that. And we're going to sort of go into, yeah, just another little segment on some of the top you know, the world's best, best, best riders going uh, well and over and above early season and what that affects going into the uh, into the year. So that's me at Pella Chat. Well, I'll be talking a bit of racing recap. I'll be unpacking what the last month's worth of World Tour racing, what's been going in the last month. This this week, we're going to chat about TDU. We've got the um, Cadell Evans race out here in Australia, plus some racing started in Europe as well, Marseille, Mallorca. And we're going to sort of discuss a little bit what's where's better to start your season. And then finally, Tom Southern, the last sort of segment we're going to chat about is Talking Tactics with Tom, where he's going to dissect some race tactics, rumors, all around teams and the view from inside the race car. Southern, what are we going to talk about this week with you, mate? Big Australia focus for me. Um, I found, uh, I think, the best flick of the Australian summer. So we're going to like dive into that a little bit um, and all the tactics from... Uh, the races we've had so far. Well, finally, of course, we're going to finish off with a little pub quiz, see if I can stitch you guys up. Maybe one week or one month, you guys can try and create a quiz. It's not as easy as you think. All 
Hi, guys. Well, uh, Pella Talk this week is doing pre-season. Look, we've been away from the peloton. Well, I've been away from the racing bunch since October. So it's probably the longest break we'll get away from our teammates, which is a, a big thing. Um, our directors, our coaches, you sort of get to this point where you start to fall into this sense of like, this is what normal life is like. And then all of a sudden it starts to build up again. And then bam, next minute we're on a flight, going to our first race. So what I'd like to sort of cover today is a little bit of that piece there, how we, how you stay fit, things like that. So, and Mitch and Tom, you can both, you know, share a few little, you know, what, what was your, maybe your favourite thing to do during that period? The favourite thing to do in the pre-season? You know, how, what do you mean? Like getting fit? Did you have fun? You, you're the only sick one that enjoys just like doing those massive pre-season preparations, those 400 TSSs out training. No, I, for me personally, I, I, I live for the pre-season. I know you live for it. Look, you just re, you're just reiterating exactly what I just said. I live for it, yeah. Like, I mean, I'll run you through, like, most mornings for me. It's like, okay. I, I get up on the training and I go <laughs> six o'clock, get to the coffee shop and I meet with my training group, which they're all fat and overweight now. And they, one's a real estate agent, one's a broker, but they always to be pretty good. Then we meet there for like an hour and then we all go training. I, I literally, it's the best thing because they're all started about 90 kilos. And by the end of summer, they're all back to race weight and uh, they're all G to get on with their, their year. So for me, it's like I, I like to G up as many guys to meet me there, and then we start the off-season together, and then we all in some way get fit together. It's just like it's the best time, and it's like kind of relaxed, and <laughs> yeah, I think it's great. I love, I, love, I love because like where you start is maybe still like about 60% above where they all end up finishing. Yeah. Yeah, like I destroyed them. It's fantastic. Like for my ego, it's great. I just put them to the sword. But they're, they're pretty sick though, these guys. Like I'll do every single interval I press set and they'll either sit on me or sit behind me. And um, so, yeah, they, they, they go hard. You know, these guys are Australian champions. You know, they, they're good. Anyway, off topic. Probably for me is that I personally like to do a bit of running just like in the off-season, the pre-season. And um, I know you did too, Mitch. Tom, did you ever dabble in the in the running? Uh, no, not when I was riding. I mean, like I was chatting to someone the other day about how the perception of that's just gone like from one thing extreme to the other. I mean, we were basically, if anyone found out you were going running, you know, 15 years ago, it was like the end of the world. I mean, nowadays, guys will finish a race and just be like, oh, I'm just going to go out for a quick run or something after the race. And you're like, what? Like, it all changed like, Will Clark, remember Will Clark from uh, he was with us and at, at, at Trek, and he used to he used to go for a run after a stage of a race, basically because he wasn't tired enough. I mean, it was a bit extreme, but yeah. Is it now ridiculed if you don't go running? Like, what are you doing? You're resting. It's weird, isn't it? But like, everyone does feel. I think everyone is fitter in general because. So talking about preseason, the base when people used to stop used to be like zero, properly zero. Whereas you're zero now, in my opinion. It's not really even that much zero, you know? You're way ahead. And I find that when we step back on it now, what I've noticed is because we continue, even in the pre-season, off-season, keeping fit, the actual step back on is a bit different too. Like it used to be this sort of like epic build, you know, like 30-hour weeks and you'd really just really have to really squeeze it because you've let yourself go so much. But because you haven't let yourself go as much, you you just step back on the 20-hour weeks or, you know, 18-hour weeks with efforts and you sort of just, continue on so that's interesting with the coaching side of things as well like you sort of there's no this huge huge crash so you don't have to like build it straight back up you have to you, you can just sort of like come down softly and then just build it back up softly i think it's probably slightly better for your overall immune system like the off season that i used to have back in 2012 versus now like there's a lot of weight to shift you mean physical weight the weight you put on yeah, physical weight. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And also just your general like lack of fitness. Like if you were to stop four weeks and not do anything, you lose quite a lot. And then, but now I still run a little bit in the week and keep the fitness. How, how much do you? How much? Yeah, but I, I would almost argue the other way because you're never really letting your body to reset. Like I think there's there still needs to be an an element of letting it absorb in the sponge. Now it feels like you're just always having that, that engine just running, you know? I mean, like, I'm talking like two or three kilos, but not like five, six. 
Yeah, but that comes down to you can still rest for a month. It doesn't mean you need to eat like cream buns for breakfast. You could talk American cereals. <laughs> That's like a big point of difference is actually looking after yourself, though, isn't it? Instead of just, you know, oh, these are all the things I couldn't do all year. Mm. I'm just going to, you know, drink loads and eat loads and like that kind of gorging mentality. So but then, uh, we've seen that, I reckon, with the best pros is the it's not like a sacrifice anymore is it it's really just who they mm. are and that's their lifestyle you know they have a they have a healthy lifestyle they cook at home that's what they enjoy you know what i mean all these things that they do around their life is like yes it doesn't seem to probably the outside person maybe quite boring because you sort of got your norma tech boots on every night but like that's just what they do and that's there's just that's who they are and i think that longevity wise for their career you notice that with some pros they come in if it's a sacrifice then their career is a little bit shorter than the guys that come in just like, oh, I'm a, I'm a bike rider. This is who I am. Mm. I just stay fit because I like it. You know, I think that, that you see them guys have, you know, 15-year careers and are always successful throughout the whole season. Tell me about this this infamous bunchy because I was talking to you about this pre-air, this, this bunch ride over in Perth. I find this phenomenal. Run us through this. I don't, like, it's one of those things is I don't really want to talk about it because it's starting <laughs> to get so much traction now that it's, it's it actually, it's illegal street racing. That's what it is. So, um, <laughs> like, I don't really want to dwell on it too much because it's got so much hype behind it. And it's like, yeah, it's great content. And um, it's about, you know, 300 people rock up to it. Like, it's insane. But, yeah, it's one of those things that you... Look, we don't we don't break the law. We stop for you know traffic lights. But you guys have both done hell right, and you know how that can be a bit like you just got to do what you got to do. You know, probably everyone's heard all the stories before. But Boxing Day, we do old Papa's ride, which actually started thirty years ago with the original Hank Vogels, um, Hank Vogel Senior, and all the crew that meet in Fremantle. They do a lap of the river, which is about eighty k, and uh, they meet back and have a coffee. And on the on the public holidays was always the ones where it was just like they go a little bit harder. You know, there's these sections in around the river that are nice and safe, open road, and you really give it some to the end, and there'd be like a little sprint at the end, and then you regroup, ride easy, go again. So that's sort of how it started. Builds a bit of momentum. Obviously, Hank Vogels Jr. comes around, and then there's all these big hitters from Perth, and it just starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the guy came along and decided to make trophies, put monies up for the preems. Um, like there was a you know, couple of sprints throughout. So then it started to get pretty hectic and just build it. And a lot of people would just actually come, you know, boxing day morning. They get out early before they have to get home to help out, you know, with kids or things like that. And they just, everyone would get up at 5.30, get to the ride at 6.30, do watch the race. Watch the bunch ride. Watch the race, you say. Watch the bunch ride more like. Nowadays, it's like insane. Like you have like four deep, five deep when you come into Port Beach. You know, it's seven o'clock in the morning. You come around this round this bend and there's a finishing flag, you know, five deep down this about 400 meter section. And uh, it's a full on sprint. And we don't stop anymore either. There's no like regrouping. It's just you start, you clip in and you go 80K as hard as you can. Like for <laughs> numbers wise, like I'll do close to two hours of like 400 normalized you know it's just like it's so hard like it's it's you just go as hard as you possibly can like we've got like this year you know jai hinley and sam wellsford and wellsford is leading out jai because jai's never won it before and i've never won it before but wellsford's won it like four times so the idea is like you've got to swap off until you drop off like there's no you're not allowed to sit in and win it the issue is now is that because within the community in perth like because it's so prestigious guys are just sitting in now and they're not doing a single turn and they're lining mm. up. Like the guy who won it today, like last this year, I don't think he did too much of a, too many pulls and he, he sat up, he saluted. Next <laughs> minute I'm getting phone calls about this kid worth signing. <laughs> like, did you call him, Tom? Yeah, did you call him? Yeah, Tom called me and said, mate, what's this kid go? You just put away Giant, Durbo mm. on the sprint. But then they've got like cars, like got three cars down Riverside Drive with people hanging out of the car with photos and video footage and sweet footage. But, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about it. Like, I think it, the thing is for me, it's like it was always something I did. So ever since I'm a junior and it's such a great day. Like I always look forward to it. And I think like there's something about even though you are pro and, you know, you don't do things that are unsafe. Like we're all bike riders. We love racing bikes. It's like you guys do those bunch rides in Melbourne. Like it's, they're not necessarily safe, but being a bike rider is not necessarily the safest thing to do. You just go and race your bike. You know what I mean? Like anyway, but uh that's that's what the Boxing Day Papas is, and yeah, sounds great. 
you know like i love how those rides like go from you know ev- like week by week or bit by bit you're like oh they're going to start going fast here so i'm going to start going fast a little bit before that i'm going to go fast a little bit before that and before you know it like you said it's like from the start to the finish it's going to be absolute full gas it's just that's how it is it's great <laughs> The reason why I wanted you to tell this story is because I the thing I love about this is it sort of brings that boyhood sort of flair back into the pro life. Like it's something I've experienced since retiring. I'm coming back to these bunch rides and I'm I'm again able to have fun. The reason why I started racing and I lost that sort of joy became a very much like a work sort of thing. And of course we love the competition, but I never did bunchies the whole time I was pro because you're like, Oh, I've got to do my training afterwards. I'm not getting involved in that. I could crash or whatever. But now I love that with puppets that you see these photos as photographed by, you know, pro photographers of Jai Hindley coming up this climb and you're in his wheel suffering and like then there's just some guy, local guy, in his wheel as well. Yeah, exactly. No, I think that's where we, for me, I've just noticed coming back to Perth, I just really enjoy that time to just be like an under 17 again, you know, and just enjoy that time, so... All right, let's get into it. This is my little segment here, the racing recap. Let's just talk about the the bugger all racing that's been on, but at least the Tour Down Under was on here in Australia and Cadell Evans race. I was over at TDU, as you obviously knew from the other podcasts. And the weird thing is with TDU, just before we actually talk about the race, Tom Southern was there as well. Durbo wasn't there. Can't believe it, Durbs. Why, why weren't you there, actually? Let's talk about that. I had a I had a son actually a newborn son uh, a couple of weeks ago little Henry so that's why I wasn't there um, second of January we he, he came and the team was good about it to give me paternity leave whatever they call it um, <laughs> for January uh, which is rare in our sport so yeah I've just um, probably would have got a bit more sleep going to TDU but uh, no it's been a good time to be at home and Stevie Williams. Took out the victory, Jonathan Navarez second, and Isaac Del Toro, three really exciting riders, and it was it was actually a really exciting end to the race. I feel like TDU is, is somewhat boring. There was one stage that should have been exciting, the Murray Bridge stage, which I was really excited about. I was like, yes, crosswind. Of course it didn't, and I'm pretty sure that's why Grady put, the race director put that stage in, but nothing happened. But once, I think one really good inclusion to the race was the double mountain finish days. It used to typically finish with Wollonga, as you know, Durbo and Tom. And it was sort of a bit of a parade the final day. Last year, they changed it to finish on Mount Lofty circuits. That was sort of okay, but didn't have the same feeling as Wollonga. So they went, let's just, I don't know why they did it, but I think it worked well. They put the, the double in. Wollonga, then with Lofty, I thought it produced a pretty good race because having that too, I guess, Tom in the car, what did you think? Like, was that a better way to have it? Did it make any difference? What do you think? Um, I quite like it when there's early hilly stage, like a paracoom or something on stage two or a corkscrew, and then you have a bit more balance and like, oh, will they get that time back, won't they? Whereas this way, it was just wait, 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 wait last weekend. And by then, there's no real jeopardy. You know, it's like if someone's taken the jersey on an early short climb and they've yeah. got a longer climb later on, maybe they're going to lose it, you know? I think stage two should have been more exciting as well. That was pretty, there was a big bunch at the end of that after Fox Creek, which was a hard climb. And then, like you said, I mean, stage four, Murray Bridge was just, had crosswinds written all over it, but just didn't happen. So I feel like it was just kind of just waiting for it to happen, waiting for it to happen, and then it happens, and then it's sort of done. One thing coming out of that stage, well, the Murray Bridge stage, but even the flat stage is the most exciting thing for me was the Bora train and seeing Sam Wellsford come out on top. Look, obviously Sam Wellsford's sprints were were really great. Um, he's been sort of showing that kind of form, but the missing element was the train and the confidence. Being a previous lead out man myself, you know, sing my own, blow my own whistle there. Um, I love watching the lead outs. That's something that I, I really love watching. I like watching the intricacies of it. And I thought um, Danny Van Poppel, Ryan Mullen, they did an awesome job. And it was cool to see Mullen uh, not Mullen, sorry, Sam Wellsford, get that confidence off those guys. I guess the question is, and it is a, it's a bit of an all-round question now I'm sort of diving into, but it starts with Wellsford, but that also goes across to Stevie Williams. It also goes across to Del Toro, guys who did very well in Down Under. Does that mean that it goes on? 
you know, because down under, yes, it is still not an easy race to win. The thing is, what does it mean really in the whole scheme of things? Like, does it mean that these guys are going to be good the rest of the year? Does it mean Wilson's going to go on and win stages you know, in the Giro? Maybe he's doing that later on because of this train. Or does it mean he just had an easy sort of start and you know, it means nothing? Derbs, like in your experience... I think personally, like you are right, the Bora train was very impressive. Like I noticed that as well. Like from the aerial footage, even the, for example, are really hard sprints to nail because they're not long stages and you're not you're not overly taxed by the end. So everyone does arrive pretty fresh, and you've got so, everyone can do something in down under sprints because everyone is only you know 130k stage or something like that. So you're not up against. Uh, you're up against everyone trying to help out their sprint trends. And a lot of teams come with like split tactics. You know, they'll help out a bit of a climber and then they'll help out their sprinter. So everyone's up there and it's all, it's a real big washing machine. It can be quite hectic. Where the Bora train, they never even got involved. They only mm. really turned up when they needed to. They never really drag raced. And we know the drag race just burn your team unnecessarily. Bora really stayed behind actually. Jayco stayed behind. Any Ine- Ineos did. A lot of the time, a terrible job. They just burnt all their men early, drag race like crazy, and then never actually were there. But Bora came late. But that takes a lot of confidence from like man four even all the way to the lead out guy, which that was pretty good. So I think this will go a long way, giving Van Poppel confidence in Sam because he's one. He's the world's best lead out man. I think is that that's a big call. Why? Like, what's he done before? Like. Where are you pulling that from? I haven't seen that kind of popple. Yeah, quality. Like he's only sort of come of age the last six months, year at the most. Go back and have a look last year. He is a good lead out man. And Boras know he's a good outland. They've they've thrown him like a four year contract. Mm. Like it's not often that the lead out man's gonna get like that long of a contract. So they realise that this guy is they need him for their sprinter. So that he comes first and then they get their sprint. So Bennett was not obviously up to what they wanted. Bennett moved on and now Wilson's in. So I reckon it's going to go a long way for these guys and, and confidence going into the season. Well, I guess an, another guy that's that sh- sort of shone for me was Isaac Del Toro, a young rider who, when another lead-out was happening by um, Israel Premier Tech, they were trying to set the stage up for Corbin Strong. And next thing you know, you know ad break, we missed it, but Del Toro <laughs> was off the front. He was just launching it. And he, it looked like, okay, if he can do this on a small, tough finish, does that mean he's set up for the GC? He's still, like, I'm not saying he wasn't up there, but I sort of expected that he was just going to absolutely dominate the race after that. Tom, what was your first sort of impressions with Isaac Del Toro? And a little bit on the back end of the question I was talking with Durbo about, I know he's super young. Did you see enough of him there to sort of predict, like, this is going to be a real guy for the future, or was this a bit of down-under-isms? It's really hard to tell with that race. I mean, for the because of the you know the, the stages that they'll be shorter than races he was doing last year. So that whole like the grind of a lot of the World Tour one week stage races, even though they're still a week long, the stages are much longer. They're much harder. It stands alone in that. It's, it's you got a lot of freedom. There's no pressure. Team would have said, oh, if you do well, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. And he managed to perform. Obviously, the kid's got a lot of talent, like bundles of it. Down Under is easier than winning Lavanier, probably, you know. So I would say that, yeah, he's got talent, but you can't take it on that race alone. And he's probably got some a lot more adaption to do when he goes to Europe. Richie Port almost broke his own record up Wollonga Hill. I believe he did 6.47. His old record was 6.39, I think. Don't quote me on that. He is moving well, Durbo. Yeah, I mean, whatever you got to do to silence the demons, I guess. Sometimes you just got to, you just got to keep training. You know what I mean? Like sometimes, you know, you you spent twenty to thirty hours a week just destroying yourself to keep yourself normal. So you know, sometimes you just got to keep it going. I saw Richie at Cape to Cape, and um, you know, I think Richie. We all know Richie could have gone either way. With in terms of, we've seen Richie in the off season, and Richie can put on some weight. I think it's good to see that Richie's stayed healthy. He loves racing his bike. He came mm. out to Cape to Cape. You can see him just having a good go there. So, yeah, like, good thing with Richie is also he's just he loves racing his bike. So, I think good on him. I mean, you can see with the likes of a lot of pros, Confidor still, you know, did Everesting. Like, you know, you still do 30 CTL stuff. 
you know, things like that. So, like, I, I don't – I think anyone who keeps it going is great. Like, you know the pressure of racing, flying well, down a mountain or something like I, that. That's not what you I, don't do anymore, but it doesn't mean you don't want to push yourself anymore, does it? I love it because he put himself in that situation and I was seeing myself, oh – I bet she's regretting this right now. Like, oh, why did I ever do this to myself? You know, like all this pressure on himself. But it, he nailed it. It would have been so hard psychologically to to do that. Or well, maybe it was fun. I don't know. One thing, lastly, a couple of last things I want to talk about in this little segment here before we move on was starting the season in Australia, something that, Derbo, you've done your whole career. And it would have been funny for you, you know, versus starting your season abroad, um, you know, over in like a lot of guys who have done the opposite to you, a lot of Euros come out and, and try their luck in Australia. But a lot of Aussies love starting their season in Australia because they, they can sort of, it's what they're used to, they're in front of home crowds. And, and we often see that massive drop off through the season. Like, like, oh, if only I could just get back to Oz and get that spark back. I don't know. I wonder what the opposite is really like for the Euros. And probably maybe it's actually a question for, for you both. Tom, you can probably answer that for for the Euro guys who you have to, you know, choose to come out here, is it something they sort of argue against and don't want to do? And Durbo, maybe for you as well, is why not, you know, Europe? And this is going to be your first time starting in Europe, essentially, and it, I see, what, see what's going to be installed for you. So, yeah, I guess, Tom, let me know what it's like for a Euro coming out and what they like. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a big challenge um, for all those guys. I mean, first and foremost, down under Cadell's is basically a three-week trip, um, which they're not used to taking at that time of year. I mean, obviously, Australians are, you know, and Americans and people who leave their home country are quite used to doing it and being in that sort of level of being in a different place. The Europeans I've experienced have, have found it quite hard. This year we had a good group saying that, though they all came out on the 26th, 27th of December already, um, acclimatised a bit. I think that naturally after years and years and years of getting ready at the same time it's still quite a quite a, like a shock in theory you should stop racing earlier i think if you're going to come from europe and have a, like a real crack at down under so september start retraining earlier because you don't have the natural you know you don't it's the same rhythms that like luke would have from years and years and years of like start preparing start racing at the same time be in summer so it, it, it's quite the shock i mean the guys obviously do heat protocol and as many adaptions as possible, but it's it's not the same, you know? Well, for me, it's going to be interesting. I'm not really sure what's going to look like. Um, watch this space. Could be the best decision I ever made. It could be the worst. Look, yeah. I, I, think it'll be, I think it'll be good. I reckon it'll be good. I think what I, I, I end up finding is probably there's about a period in the classics, maybe just before Roubaix or Flanders time or whatever, and you, you literally have, you've gone to threshold so much from the 1st of January until mid-April. And you're like, I'm so tired now. Like, you're just, you're done. You really are done and you really are struggling. And, and I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface yet. You know, like I, this week I started training, like, like okay, let's really step into it for my last week until I head over to Tour of Oman. And then I do Tour of Oman and then I go opening weekend. But I don't even feel like I put a race number on. I'm so relaxed. Like I, I haven't even really started to push in terms of I can go out tomorrow and do the hardest ride I want. You know, like all these sort of things where up, down, under, you are, especially with our team, how much pressure normally is on our team. The national title is always a big focus. Cadell's, et cetera. You sort of come back and you're like, oh, I need a quick week off and then I'm going to travel to Europe and then it's going to be freezing. So you're just like, it's not mm. summer anymore. You've got to put rain jackets on. It takes you half an hour to get ready to go training. There's all these little factors, as we all know. And then all of a sudden you're like, right, now I'm going to be ready for Paranese or whatever. It is a shock and I think I'm interested to see how it feels because at the moment I feel really great and, and, and feeling good. So I'm excited about it. But um, what I will say is that like doing success in Down Under and doing success at uh, Nationals, I don't like regret that in any way because that's also why I am on this team and also is so important to this team and it's built my career over it and I sort of think like I've you know won many national titles and we've won many down unders because we put the effort in so I think for the Aussie guys and the guys who really want to focus for down under like it's worthwhile if you come out and you get success because it's a world tour race big start to the season and you do go into the season feeling like right yeah I'm, I'm, I'm ready I'm, I'm already in a good place so I would never like, I don't do down under to anyone. It's like, just come and, but if you're going to come, do it fucking properly. 
don't mm. half ass it because I don't think in the end of the day you feel good about doing that because you come and get your head kicked in because it's so hot. And then then you go back to Europe and you're like, I'm not in the right shape. So you probably overtrain. And then you're in there getting sick and you know, it's a snowball effect. So if you are going to come do down under, do it well and do it properly. And then with the team, I'm sure you guys are doing the same now. Tom is like, just give those guys that little bit of you know recovery before they step into it again. Exactly. Right, so obviously we want to use this segment, lads, to talk a little bit about the tactics of the races we're seeing through the year. I think this could be a really cool thing to do. Unfortunately, we're faced with having just done the Tour Down Under, which basically has no tactics, right? A massive lack of tactics. No, it's it, its its own challenge. Um, Mitch got a really good grab from Sam Bewley, the Israel uh, DS, who had the right tactic of bringing the best rider to the race. We're going to play this little clip now, have a listen, and then we can chat about what Sam had to say. Yeah, Stevie's been flying under the radar a bit. Um, obviously, we it was sort of Corbin Strong. He was, um, you know, our primary leader for this race when we came here. And we showed that card straight away in the first stage. We chased down the, the first bonus sprint, 25k into the stage one to take bonus seconds. Um, then the next day, actually, Corbin woke up not feeling very well. Miraculously, he uh, he's a hard bastard, so he actually got through the second stage and finished second on the stage. Um, but then from then on, was, uh, his health started to decline a lot. So we had Stevie Williams as our as our little sleeper and uh, we, we switched the focus across to Stevie already on the third stage um, but you know thankfully most teams were pretty obsessed with Corbin you know the old bonus second trick here has worked before and uh, until down under so we kind of just kept that card we kept Stevie really quiet and we kept playing that card of Corbin going for bonus seconds and then I think teams were wondering why we weren't closing gaps for Corbin to sprint but we were just trying to nurse him through the through the tour and keep him as a little bit of a decoy um, and we knew Stevie was ready to, for today for Wollonga. So it's been all about Stevie the last couple of days. And thankfully we kept the secret. And uh, now everybody can see what we were doing. It was amazing because I was just speaking to a lot of other riders. They couldn't quite understand why you guys weren't going for those seconds. As you said, this is the way down under is won. I guess the question is, how did you know to have so much confidence in Steve? Um, because, yeah, it's, it's a big, I guess, a gamble in a way. I guess you, you knew that he had the watts. Tell me a little bit how you guys sort of came to this race with him in mind. Yeah, Stevie, Stevie's a, he's an unassuming character. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we were going to keep him on GC. That was the plan from the start. Uh, we saw in training when he got here, doing some efforts on Wollonga, doing some efforts on Mount Lofty, uh, that he's, he's producing the numbers that you, that you need to do on those climbs. And with the numbers he was producing in training, um, you know, it would, take, it would take someone pretty special to, to go up there much faster. So we knew he was, he was a card, but obviously we wanted to bank seconds for Corbin and we knew we needed probably 20 seconds or maybe a little bit more for Corbin. And um, the reality was we couldn't get them because of his health. So, you know, we just kept an eye on Stevie. We just kept his, kept his mind in the game. We didn't put too much pressure on him, but we just made, made sure he was aware that, you know, he's still our card for, for Wollonga and we probably would have played it anyway, even with Corbin on, on time. Um, but yeah, he, he, these climbs are just suited to him, these, these short efforts, the numbers he can produce. He won Arctic Tour of Norway last year, which is similar sort of climbs, short and steep climbs. So, uh, you know, he's suited to those climbs. So if, if he's in good condition, we knew we could do something with, with him. Looking to tomorrow, last day, you think it suits him around Lofty and your idea about how he can really clinch this now? Big victory for you, for the team, for him for Daryl Impey, first race as a DS. That's it. I mean, he's a Daryl. We've got Daryl here in the car with with me. So yeah, Prince Prince of uh, Prince of Adelaide. But I mean, at the end of the day, like it's pretty simple. If if you can finish second on Malunga, generally you shouldn't get, you should be okay on Mount Lofty. Um, you know, he showed today that he's within within the best climbs of the race. So we shouldn't be concerned about Mount Lofty. He's equal on time with Oscar Onley. Uh, so again, goes back to the bonus seconds. Uh, they do they do count. And to it and under, no matter how, how hard the, the profile is. But Stevie was fourth, uh, third on stage two, so he got four seconds there. So that's why um, he's on equal time with Oscar Onley. So tomorrow it's just going to be, you know, we can complicate it as much as we want or think of all the different options. But at the end of the day, we just want Stevie to cross the finish line with the front guys and uh, he'll win the tour. I mean, like I said, Stevie's obviously great, but there's a little bit of sneakiness in there, which you don't like normally get or you don't really hear about that often in cycling. Um, a lot of it goes on, but I really love the fact that they kept Corbin in the race to try and set everyone off the scent. I mean, I was there and I've got my own opinion on it. But when I heard it afterwards, I was like, oh, damn it. I think, that, I think the thing I like about this is it would have been all good and well to say that that interview 
after Sunday. If I had caught him, because that was recorded outside the Hilton Saturday night, so they still had to win the race. But he was confident in that in that play. So I think it would have been all good and well to say on Sunday night, yeah, this was the big plan we had and that's why we won. But he was going out and saying that the day before the end of the race. So he's pretty confident in the plan. And I think, I don't know whether that would have, I don't know, Dervs, you can maybe comment on this too, but I don't know how much you'd really buy into that or how much difference that really made for the team. Maybe psychologically, I mean the other teams, maybe it was just a psychological thing for their own team that Stevie Williams, it took the pressure all off his shoulders. He could fly under the radar. But was anyone expecting Stevie Williams when he came here to win down under? Like, was he a marked man? So I don't know what the tactic did. It was funny and it was it was clever, I guess, in a way. But did it really help him win? Personally, I think potentially it would have. And uh, maybe not in terms of, like, tricking everyone that, you know, we're working for Corbin. Like, I don't think, you know, seeing yeah. Corbin behind Stevie or Stevie behind Corbin or, you know, leading him out, I don't really think it makes that much of a difference. But I think maybe mentally for Stevie, knowing that we've done that also when we bring multiple options yeah. to a race with, like, say, Michael Matthews, we really focus on Bling to try and get in the stage. And Simon Yates, is just he's just overdoing his thing. You know, he's just chilling. Like, no one's having those two leaders or even three leaders in a race. Those guys can, like deviate the pressure like they can have a day off you know if we're really going for Corbin today do sprint bonuses and sprint preems and all these things Stevie's just chilling like like a psychological psychological day off you mean exactly like you said psychological I think that's the biggest thing that would have made the difference I mean where I think it like probably worked the most I mean it made no difference when I went back and looked at how like we did our race for example you know Corbin was there and he was in the race then all of a sudden he wasn't and it's like okay that changed but <laughs> where I think it's good is that between their riders, they felt like they were having something over everybody else, getting buy-in. And they're like, oh, nobody knows about this. We're doing this. And that's why I think it was really smart by Sam and Daryl to do it, whether they intended it th- that way or not. Because, and this is one of the things I wanted to pick up about those guys, like they did, you know, they're relatively new directors. You know, you both know them very well. They yeah. did an excellent job. Um, on the last day, for example, like the way they paced that out, we had, it was a tricky stage, and I sent my rider Stefan de Bod down the road with the intention of attacking from the bunch later when it was close. And they left the gap go out too far at the key point, like further than it should have gone, perhaps four minutes or so. And Stefan was at about a minute on DC. Gone like relatively far. It's a good group. They got a tail. So he was leader moving. on the road. Was he leader on the road? He was leader on the road for the whole last day. But it stopped us attacking from behind because they like basically waited for Ineos to close the gap at the very, very end. So there was never the space to attack in the middle of the race. I looked at that and I thought they've got so, you know, they did really well. They paced their effort perfectly because it's not easy. You know, you go into that stage having to ride with the jersey on your back. Everyone's going to attack you. Every, everyone's close in down on yeah. So You can't really let anyone go. Uphill start. So you're only going to have good riders in the breakaway. It's not going to be a fluke break. That was managed really well. And I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, they've got really good buy-in from their riders. Whatever plan they're coming up with, they're really getting into. I wanted to ask you guys, what not so much the character, but like what sort of difference it is whether like having a different DS, you know, like do you get a little bit energised sometimes? You're like, oh, great, so-and-so's coming. He's going to come up with like a wild plan to go ape shit, Or oh, yeah. we've got so-and-so, it's going to be quite tame, you know? It can get really easily destroyed. Like, I remember, like, way back, like, Skill Shimano days, we had this, it's actually a pretty famous, um, I don't think it's a DS anymore, Marang Zeman, actually, he's one of the, the head honchos at um, Yumbo Visma. And he started at Skill Shimano, and here's my DS, would have been my first or second year. And I remember we had nothing to do in this race. We had no one on GC, no one really doing anything in a race. And all of a sudden, we got the call on the radio, boys, bring this break back. Get on the front, start chasing. And I was thinking... That's strange. Like, what are we doing here? So we're just drilling it up the front. We're drilling it. And I'm like, what is going on here? Why? Like, I can barely even finish this race, let alone start riding. I think it was in, like, Route to Sud or something. So a super hard race for us. Into the bottom of some epic climb. We're pulling, we're pulling. Of course, you know, when we get to the bottom of this climb, the, the attacks go. And I was like, the car came up next to me. I was like, who are we even pulling then? You know? And it's like, what the hell are you? I'm having this blow up through the window. What's going on here? Now I'm dropped. I'm out of the race. And, you know, then I hear this whisper. I'm dropped. I'm dropped with another ride. It's like, 
Oh, you know why we're pulling is because with the DS, well, not the team or someone was getting paid, you know, I'm like, so like, so we'll, we'll supposedly we're making money out, but we didn't even make any money out of that because we had to get the gap under three and a half minutes. That was the deal that got struck. So we got it to like four minutes or something. It had to be under two minutes. I don't know what it was, but we got it to like 30 seconds within that. And then of course the team just attacked over the top of us, got us all dropped and they're like, sweet, thanks guys. So my whole perception then of, of Morang was like, uh, now I don't know if I can really buy into the next time you need a ride. So it can also, I know that was a funny scenario, but it also can get destroyed with like the wrong call. What was the result of that? Did you guys talk about it in the bus after or was it just, that was it? Well, I, I blew up at the window, which is not advisory, advised, you know, on the road just having like a shout shout fest halfway up some climb so then he just drove off and then i got back to the camper there was no buses in skill got back to the camper and um then next thing i heard the car like zoom up with the brakes screeching and i was like where's mitch where's mitch i was like oh here we go and um yeah i had to come out and i don't ever speak to me like that again you know the team doctor was in the car so like in the end he never really admitted to getting paid but there was no other explanation and I heard that, so it could be all hearsay. I'm throwing a massive thing out in the wind here. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you had a tactic that made no sense, right? And it's it made no sense. Yeah. So there was no. The point is, there was no buy-in, and there's been numerous other situations, but there's one that sprung to mind straight away: is that there was no buy-in, there was no explanation of why we were doing it. Maybe an explanation needs to be said. This is what we're doing, we're trying to set something up, so you can buy into it. And as a team, if you buy into it and it doesn't make any sense, you don't care because that's the plan. You're doing it together. When you're down under, you had Bewley and you had Impey. And what I've noticed is the direct, the fresh director from the Peloton, like yeah. within a year or two, does make a huge difference. Like, it's like, you just, it's, it's unfortunate for the directors that are, you know, further out. That you don't have that connection with the rider and the buy in from the rider is because mm. they know, they know intricately the riders you're racing against. They also know every year the peloton changes slightly with how it races. An old school director now is like, you guys are fucking idiots. I'm like, yes, we are because we race a bit like that sometimes. You know, like when in Tour of Flanders would you have 120K before the break goes? It just like never happened, but like it happened last year, you know? So if you have a director who retired recently, like MP and Buley, you've got this like understanding that you were just in the trenches just yesterday and we can then like chat about that and then they can go let's do that because we know what he's going to be like or make an in joke about the peloton so that connection i think lasts for probably two or three years regardless what they would say they're going to get a huge buy-in from these guys because they raced with them last year mp was teammates with them you know what i mean so i think that's probably that's probably why as well um, that they got that at down under because that group they all raced with each other last year billy mm-hmm. was in the peloton last year that's why they got that great close connection, and that might not happen again because they're they're another year or two out. No, uh, you're in trouble, Southern. Your jobs on that on that theory, <laughs> your jobs on the line. No connection <laughs> when you're calling the shots. Thirteen years down the line, so moving you out there, Southern. Not at all. But <laughs> no, 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 no. But like, do you, you 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 understand that as well? With you guys, you have a lot of young guys coming in as directors too now with TJ, and, um, Seabass, and things like that. But I, I agree 100% when we, I've seen it, you know, happen. And you get, it's also the energy you have as an ex-bike rider in the first one or two years, you have just have more energy because all of a sudden you stop getting knackered all the time. And you, you know, you have these guys start as sports directors and they're messaging you at like 10 or 10, 30 at night or 11 o'clock or whatever. Oh, what about this? What about that? You're like, give it two years, man. <laughs> Let's see how keen you are to, you know, be going through Mitch Docker's CTL in uh, three years time. At I thought you were going to say something else like, Hey, mate, we're going down for a beer now or whatever. You're like, no, nah, mate, I'm already nah, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super enthusiastic. But yeah, I think it, I think it's right. I think that sort of buy-in, the important thing is once it does work with the tactic, even if you get further away from the riders, if you have a history of it working, then that gets its own buy-in because you get your own strength that way, which I find super interesting. But uh, yeah. Derbs, I was going to ask you if you've got any examples of a really good tactic that you've done in a race that's worked out well look i think i mean i was really racking my brains to try and work out one because it's pretty tricky because the, the tactic book gets mm. thrown out the window a lot of the time um what i really do enjoy is the the ability to think on the on the road like 
that's where I think when you've got a director who empowers you, um, like we had some quite good tactics in, it's not a great tactic because I missed it, but it's sort of, we had this classic team, for example, Heyman came in, this is this fresh mindset. And we're at Kent where we didn't win the race, but we were sort of, we're pushing shit up here to even win the race. And we were actually pushing shit up here to do anything in the classics. Like our whole team was actually not doing great, you know? And like, because as a director, like you said, yeah, great tactic because you brought the strongest rider to fear under. A strongest rider will make you look good. But it's the director who mm, like gets yeah. buy-in from the weakest team to like actually get themselves in a bike race in a situation where you don't have the men. And in the classics, you know how hard that is. Is like pretty good. So we had like Ken Wervergren and there's this, we're heading out towards the Moran and Heyman's like, it's, a filthy day it's like crosswinds probably a couple of years ago and it was just like Heyman's like look I know you boys are struggling I know you guys aren't in the shape like I'd been sick another guy had been sick we had literally no one there and I was like what I want you guys to do is slam it in the gutter when you come out of this block that means nothing you sort of head out on this highway heading towards the punter the coast you go around this block you come out and you go back onto the main road so what I want you guys to do is just it's like 170k from the finish. I just always want you to slam it in the cutter, you know, and like everything you got. So, okay, sweet. Like, what are we doing this, mate? Like, none of us can even do 180k in the front group. Like, we're all going to be dropped anyway. It's like, <laughs> just going to do this because I want you guys to show that you guys are strong and it's all about, you know, mindset or whatever. So, we come out of the corner and we just slammed it in the gutter and Edmondson, Alex Edmondson, he has this like insane amount of two minute power, just did this like four body. Like, he hooped himself. They went that hard, you know? He calls this split, 20 guys, and we have six guys in 20 or five guys in 20. And I'm in the group, second group, missed it. <laughs> Didn't really matter. Like Jack Bauer, Alex Edmondson, um, had another guy there. Michael Matthews was there. Armand, George Jensen. And we just had like <laughs> these guys. And we swapped up all the way. Matthews was fifth. And again, we were, then that group never came back. We never came back. Like they just yeah, swapped off. Awesome. We never caught them with 180k to go. They never caught them. And it was just like, for me, that was like a tactic that we all bought into. And even in my role, like I rode across to first group on the, on the camel because I was so shitty that I missed it. Like I ended up having a really great race going, you know, because of like, fuck, my teammates are up there. I need to get mm. up there. Like, because I've missed out and I was meant to be there and I feel so shit about missing it. That's probably one of those things that you had no hope. But a tactic does make a difference, like as a director, the way you delivered it. And Heyman was that fresh face, that energy that brought that thing. And yeah, it does. It does work. It does. It does. It does work. Oh, well, fellas, I mean, as I said, there wasn't really uh, too many tactics to discuss in the Australian summer. So we'll uh, wrap it up there until we get some more action in Europe later in the year. Well, guys, it's been a nice little wrap-up of what's been going on. Let's get to the real stuff now, the pub quiz. The quiz, I don't think I should call it the pub quiz. Let's just call it the communique quiz. I don't know, I've got to think of a better name than that. Let's get doing it. I'll read the quiz this week, but you guys need to come up with your own quiz next week. I don't know, someone can nominate to do the next quiz. Um, I'm starting to get sick of doing these quizzes. It's hard to think of questions. Trip you guys up. All right, I've got five questions for this week. Chime in when you know them. How many races, it's an A, B, C, or D, all right? So just wait for the full answers. How many races did I win in my career? A, zero, B, three, C, two, or D, five. How many races did I, Mitch Docker, win in my career? Five. Dermo, D, five. Southern, three, confident. Dermo, five, I like it. I like your answer. Fortunately, Derva, you are wrong. I wish I'd won five. Southern, three. Do you actually know what the three are? Including Team Time Trial, right? I didn't Team include... Team Time Trial at the zero. Route to Sud stage and the, the one in uh, Holland, whatever it was. You actually... That was in Holland. You actually remember one more one more race than I did. So it's actually four. <laughs> ah, shit. What was the other one? I've got a trick one in there. It's not Williamstown Bakery. You can't include yes, the Williamstown yes. Bakery. Come it's on. still a race. I still won it. I went hard to win that race. What is the oldest race in the world? A, Paris-Roubaix. B, Liège-Bastogne-Liège. 
C, Parry Tours, or D, Melbourne to Warrnambool? I think it's Warney, but yeah, Warney, I think. Turbo's locking D in, Southern. I, I missed C and D. Sorry, mate. C is Parry Tours. D is Melbourne to Warrnambool. I think Durbo's right. I'm going to go with Parry Tours anyway, just for fun. Oh, you're both wrong. It is the age. Do you know what year? No, I don't know what year, but I, I just, sort of that was my first pick. And then I'm like, oh, the Warney, like they keep going on about how old that race is when they promo it. So I was like, oh, shit. Warney's the second oldest ah, in the world. I thought you meant the oldest race. Yeah. I thought you meant the oldest race in France. But it's it's Liège's the, the oldest, Warney, 18, 1895, Liège's 1892. Then you've got Roubaix and Paris Tours both on 1896. Mm. All right. This is one. Derbo, you should know this one. Southern, you should know this too. How much volume in milliliters is in a pint of beer? A, 500 milliliters. B, 425. C, 568. Or D, 468. C. How many milliliters in a pint of beer? D. Durbo? Four, six, eight. Southern. How'd you know that? I remember pouring out when I was a kid. I had a, a pint glass in my house and I bought a 500 milliliter bottle of Coca-Cola. I poured it into the pint glass and it didn't quite fill it. So <laughs> I knew it's not 500 and I knew it's over. Yeah, that's how I worked it out. Durbo, good guess. Four, six, eight. The right numbers, but if the five was one off. All right, two questions to go. Still racing in the pro peloton, who has raced the most number of UCI race days? A, second best lead out man in the world, Michael Morkov. B, Mark Cavendish. C, Simon Geshka. Or D, Yiki Aya Arashuro. Morkov. Geshka. Close. Morkov's at 12.43. Geshka's at 12.22. But it's neither of them. Arashiro. Arashiro's at 12.09. Cav. Cavi. Wow. 12.86. 1,286 race days. Last question. Durbo, this is a special one in here for you, mate. How many kids does Yen Vo- Yen's Void have? A, four. B, three. C, six. Or D, none. Six. Six is correct. Southern, did you know that? How many kids did he have uh, when he was racing still? Six. How ridiculous is that? He had six. He was, In 2011 was his sixth kid, and he, he raced till 2.14. Step it up, Durbo. Five to go, mate. Guys, thanks a lot. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. This is Race Communique, and we'll see you next month. See you, boys. See you, fellas.